Hey folks, uh, VJ Lachman here. I'm the uh, author of Mythborn, and I'm super excited to be sharing the world and uh, just the entire process I went through to build it. So uh, I thought to start our Facebook Live event and the first one we've done, uh, a couple of caveats. One, uh, this is the first one we've done, so we'll probably make mistakes. Two, if there's dead air, then I'm going to go nuts. So hopefully my friends will jump in and ask me questions. <laughs> And three, uh, I thought the way this would work, because it's going to be me talking for 20 minutes and trying to answer questions people throw up into the chat box, um, will be to give you guys a little intro on me, a little background on the things that I think influence Mythborn, and then talk a little bit about the Mythborn, the universe, the characters, Eden, the world, and then what I see coming up. For those of you who have been following Mythborn, uh, book one is out. Book two will be out uh, this weekend. We're just waiting on some fantastic, fabulous art from my amazing book cover creator, Raymond Lejin. Uh, for those of you who have been uh, aware of and seen the book covers he's come up with, they are absolutely fantastic. And so we want to make sure we got the best cover out there for book two. Uh, but the book is done and it's ready to go. I just got to hit the little send publish button on KDP. And then uh, for book three, we're in editing. It'll be out uh, probably the next month. And book four, we're targeting for the end of summer. So I think things are really trucking along. I'm actually uh, more than three quarters of the way done writing book four. And book five has been completely outlined. So I'm pretty excited about delivering book five to you guys, hopefully uh, before the end of the year. So let's start. Mythborn. Mythborn uh, really began because I grew up at a time when fantasy was just everything to me. Um, believe it or not, I grew up in Bangkok, Thailand, and when I moved to the United States, my father is a doctor. When we moved here, he uh, decided that Wisconsin would be the place to go. So I went from a subtropical South China Sea, never seen snow, to a um, to a um, to a whiteout condition in you know just south of Canada, um, I literally had never seen snow. I, I didn't know what ice was. I frankly thought Americans must be the greatest warriors in the world because they walked around with blades on their feet. And then I realized those were for skating on ice. Uh, so total culture shock. But what it did do is just create me at a very young age, I was about eight or nine years old, it created this wonder, this willingness to just be amazed by the world itself. So I think Mythborn was influenced by that because I realized when I write, I want to bring that kind of just moment, that momentary lapse of reason, to quote a, a song that I love, uh, you know, and, and just let yourself lose yourself in, in a world like, like Mythborn. Um, for those of you who know anything about me or have watched that, I was uh, originally a video game designer. Uh, I did about 85 titles. The first uh, few uh, were awesome learning experiences, another way of saying I made every mistake you could possibly make in the book. Uh, but my third title was Elder Scrolls Arena, and uh, it was the birth of what has become the largest and most successful RPG franchise on the planet. Uh, and that's not underestimating or underscoring or understating uh, its success. I attribute 99% uh, of that to the amazing team at Bethesda and how well they took um, a lot of the notes and maps and different ideas that we had been talking about and really uh, built a world far beyond anything I could have done on my own or, or you know, at that time. So uh, from Elder Scrolls, uh, I did another 85 video game titles uh, at various companies. Um, I got to work with the uh, great folks at Looking Glass. I worked on Thief the Dark Project. I worked on Flight Unlimited. I got to work with the uh, awesome folks over at FASA on Battletech, Mech Commander. I designed a game called Shadowrun Assassin. Um, I then went on and had a chance to work at Universal, where I got a chance to see some greats like Mark Cerny and 
and uh, Ted Prince and other people, Ted Price and other people who worked on Spyro and Crash, uh, just really inspirational stuff. Um, ultimately, I got a chance to come back to the East Coast from LA, uh, and we, um, you know, started a, a, a company basically to help folks who wanted to get into games uh, get into games. And when I say folks, I mean companies. My first client was National Geographic. What an amazing opportunity! Here was a, a place that I had grown up looking at, had taken people to all over the world, and suddenly I was working there. I couldn't. I couldn't believe it. I was just so lucky. And my um, my wonder of the world never changed. I had a chance now to not only be part of that wonderful world, but be part of a company that celebrated that world in every single way possible. So very, very lucky to be doing that. When I was there, we did uh, 38 or so titles that came out of there over the three years I was there. And um, one of them was Animal Jam with the uh, great guys over at Smart Bomb, uh, Clark Stacey and, and his whole team. Animal Jam ended up being one of the top um, kids MMOs to ever launch. And I think uh, they just killed it, um, when it when it came to building something interactive and fun. So long story short, lots of gaming. Had a great time uh, learning about how to go about building amazing stories and worlds. I think what gaming did for me is really hone the skill set needed to be creative uh, or to understand how to be creative when when there were times I didn't feel super creative. Uh, you have to understand that in video game development there's millions of dollars at stake and it resides and, and rests in the hands of the team building it. So management uh, oft times has to spend a lot of time trying to make sure that people are uh, doing their best. One of the things that um, I think, sorry we have people in the background and there's going to be some noises but you know we'll do our best to, to try and keep the interruptions and the, and the noise to uh, stand still. But one of the things I, you know, to, ca to get back to what I was saying, um, you, can't, you can't force someone to be creative. So we came up with ways in which uh, we could remember or uh, create inspiration for people to be creative when they didn't feel like it. So a lot of those techniques and skills I've been using uh, to keep myself generating great content, I hope great content, for Mythborn at a regular pace. Um, so let's see, what are the inspirations that I uh, see for Mythborn? Well, I've really enjoyed fantasy, like I said. I've also really enjoyed science fiction. Some of the huge um, influencers for me were people like Richard K. Morgan with Altered Carbon. Uh, I read the novels. I thought they were amazing. Um, the um, most, most recently Netflix released the uh, television show and I think they did an exceptional job of translating what would be a very difficult novel, I thought, to translate to the television screen. It was engaging. If you got a chance to see it, I would recommend super, super uh, opportunities. I mean, I'm sorry, super, super, uh, I would recommend it super, super highly. Go in, have a look. I mean, this whole universe is about people who can change bodies and wear sleeves. And I think it was just brilliant. Uh, just brilliantly done. Um, another big influencer for me was uh, Peter F. Hamilton and uh, his series called The Neutronium Alchemist. What a world. I mean, he envisioned a world in the future where uh, death is no longer an issue. We're pretty much hard disks that are implanted, you know, in people. And uh, you have a, a relatively immortal lifetime. But what do those people do for fun? Uh, and when, you know, when you run into problems, uh, how do you solve those problems when death isn't really a problem anymore? One of the things that's really interesting about the story is he combined science fiction with fantasy because he had uh, the worlds that were held by the human domain were invaded by essentially zombies. And what now you had was this clash of technology and a fantasy, and that 
uh, was definitely an inspirational note for me when it came to Mythborn. Um, I can't not mention Orson Scott Card. I can't even know where to begin. I mean, obviously Ender's Game, that everyone knows that. But what about the Farseer trilogy? I mean, it's about an assassin, a kid, uh, you know, the, the bastard son of a, of a prince. And, you know, the adventures of Fitz Chivalry and the way he goes about running, uh, the way he goes about growing up, it just blew me away. It was written in the first person. I thought Robin Hobb did, I mean, I thought, I'm sorry, Farseer trilogy by Robin Hobb. Robin Hobb did such a great job uh, of building that whole entire thing up. And let me just back up. So Orson Scott Card, obviously Ender's Game, all that stuff. I couldn't get him off my mind, I, and, I, and I, uh, I think I threw his name out there early. But, wow, I mean, if you've seen Ender's Game or if you've read the books, if you've read about Bean, if you've read about all the things that go on with Ender and Bean and his brother Peter and all the things there, I mean, it is, uh, it is quintessential reading if you enjoy science fiction. Now on to Robin Hobb and the Farseer Trilogy. Sorry. Story about an assassin, fit chivalry, um, written in the first person. I learned so many skills in writing, reading that book. I remember there's a moment during the reading when uh, something happens to the main character. And I, I just... I, you know, it, it emotionally, it, it was an emotional moment for me because I had to stop reading. And then I felt, I don't know if you guys have ever felt this before, but I actually wanted to read slower so that the moment would last longer. And that is a, is a, that is a powerful, uh, that's a powerful way to be a writer. And I, I hope one day to have moments like that in, in Mythborn. Um, let's see, you know, I think, I think you really can't get away from where fantasy has grown to and gone unless you include George R.R. R. Martin and Game of Thrones. I mean, here's a person who's taken fantasy and taken it from the, the place where we, uh, the community of game you know, players, geeks, nerds, uh, techno files and techno uh, savvy folk, um, you know, he took it from that, and he took it to the mainstream audience. I mean, it's got to say something when my mom calls me and asks me what's going to happen, do I think, to, you know, uh, the the Starks. I, it just, <laughs> it's one of those surreal moments where, you know, you have a Indian mother calling you about something happening in, in Winterfell. <laughs> I can't, I mean, you can't, you can't make that up. It's just it's the kind of stuff that I got to remember and write about sometime. Um. Now, you know, every single one of these authors has taught me something special about how to write, how to read, and, uh, I mean, sorry, how to write, how to, like, elicit emotion, how to elicit all kinds of stuff. Um, one of the things that, you know, I want to make sure I go through is a couple of the games that influenced me, too. And then we'll get on to things about, like, Mythborn and the books and what goes on. It's great because when you guys are typing things up, they pop up so that everyone can read them. And uh, it's really helpful because it gives me a little list of things to go through. So you guys are actually helping me plan out my, uh, my, uh, my thought process, and I appreciate that. So clearly I love RPGs. I mean, I designed an RPG as one of my very first games. Uh, right now I'm playing Divinity 2 Original Sin. I think the tactical combat mixed with the amazing character class customization is really awesome. Um, I've been playing XCOM 2. I love turn-based combat. I think XCOM 2 might be uh, the quintessential turn-based combat uh, game that's out there currently. Uh, I've been playing They Are Billions, uh, zombie apocalypse. Uh, I love seeing billions of zombies coming at my fortress, so that's definitely cool. Northguard. I think that the uh, Steam uh, early access on Northgard and now the game itself have proved to be really cool if you like Vikings and if you like you know, real-time strategy and city building. It's really cool. And I just got Frostpunk. I have turned it on and watched the opening. I want to play it, and every time I begin to play it, I'm told to go back to writing. So I'll sneak in some time later and let you guys know what I think. Why am I telling you about games? Well... Because 
Um, when I decided that I was going to become a writer full time, I talked to my best friend and also president of Dawn's Light Media, who uh, you know is the the lead on on all the Mythborn books. And we said, let's not just do writing. Let's do the books, but let's also do a video game. Let's make sure that we write a television script. Let's make sure that we have a movie script ready to go. So we expect to expand Mythborn into a giant uh, multi-format uh, event. And uh, you can be guaranteed there will be a video game. You can be guaranteed we are going to try and get it onto the television screen, onto the movie screens as an animated series. Um, and you will, I think, uh, enjoy not just the five books of the Mythborn series, but the world itself, which I've built so that the next series, Techborn, will be um, built into the same universe and really expand on it and bring that merging of science and fantasy together in a way that I think uh, will be unique, interesting, and and mind blowing. I hope. So, um, Mythborn. What's it about? Well, I wanted to write the story of a bad guy, and not not like a bad guy, like the kind like that sits in a tower and wonders. Well, actually, that's a great that's a great point. So, one of the things that I wondered all the time was when you have a character like Saruman standing, you know, sitting in a tower, looking down, and you know, uh, you know, telling people to destroy and to whatever he says, and then you know he kills the guard who comes with bad news or whoever this ultimate bad guy is, and now he's by himself and the scene ends. In real life, what does he do? Like. He's in a tower by himself. I didn't see any furniture in that scene. I don't know where he sits. I don't know if there's another guard somewhere that's going to bring food up to him at some point. I mean, he's pretty high up. And um, I think one of the really laughing and, and entertaining moments was um, when you looked at J.J. Uh, Abrams' take on Star Wars and when the new Sith Lord in, in uh, Kylo comes out of the elevator and, and he's smashing everything and those two stormtroopers turn the corner and they like stop and then they turn and walk the other way. That made sense to me. Like who would go around the bad guy when he's in that mood? What guard would come to to deliver bad news? I mean, it's so I just found these scenes to be what I call uh, what I think is termed white, white room syndrome. And what that means is that a lot of times they're written so that the scene can be written, but uh, but not because they're connected to anything else in the world, and not because there's any consequence to the actions that are going on there. They essentially are a green screen or a backdrop, so the two characters or a character and someone else can interact. And that, to me, seemed very artificial. It seemed not to have a, a ring of, tr of, of realism around it. And one of the things that I think we, we face as fantasy writers is People think it's easy to write fantasy because you can do anything you want, but you really can't. Like, you have to have even a more stringent rule set so that people believe the fantasy that you're writing. And as a result, what I realized was there will never be a, a, a version in my book where there's just a scene and a backdrop and then something happens. I wanted that scene to be part of the living world of Eden, the world where Mythborn takes place. So... In the descent of a person from uh, one place to another, and I hesitate to call it good to evil, I think it's more aligned and unaligned, um, I looked at it like this. Ultimately, uh, character A will like character B as long as character B is doing something to further character A's desires. And if character B becomes diametrically opposed to character A's desires, then to each other, they're both evil. And whoever wins is going to write the history and portray that person as evil, as dastardly, as whatever. And I think that you see that in real life all the time. Um, you see it when people get divorced. You see it when people uh, become, you know, break up friendships. They break up, you know, any relationship they have. The other person was the person at fault always. But really, you know it's 50-50, and really in the end, 
there's a lot of um, human emotion happening during that descent. And so I wanted to capture that in the path of my main character, Eric. Um, he starts out as a young apprentice uh, learning how to be sort of a warrior monk assassin. Uh, his master, Sylvain, is uh, a, literally a living weapon. Uh, Eric has been in this world, has been basically training. He's about 17 years old. And through a number of little circumstances, he finds out that because of a unique ability he has to negate magic, his, uh, he has been uh, designated by the monks that run his order to be thrust into a gate that's open between Eden and the world of Arcadia. This gate is open from time to time, and whenever it does, demons flood through, they possess people, and then they disappear. This time, uh, because of the amount of damage that had been done during the last demon wars, magic has been outlawed. Because magic has been outlawed under pain of death, there are very few mages left in the world, very few people to protect them from this rift opening. So, uh, you know, a trying, uh, a difficult time without many solutions calls for an awful solution, and that is the sacrifice of one to sort of protect the many. And I remember uh, a moment of inspiration about this because I was... Rarely does television shock me, but I will tell you, and this goes back some years, so clearly we've all matured, but there was an episode of 24 uh, with Kiefer Sutherland where the terrorists called in and they said, if you don't execute the CTU director by a certain time, we'll release a super virus, a toxin in the city, or, or a nuclear bomb, I can't remember which one it was, but the point was, ultimately, they sequestered that CTU director. He couldn't leave. They had disarmed him. And then, ultimately, Keeper Sutherland executed him. Uh, Jack Bauer killed him. And I thought to myself, that can't really happen, can it? Like, can an FBI agent be ordered to die in order to save an entire city? And, and if he can't, I mean, I actually found myself arguing both sides. It's like, shouldn't he be ordered to die if it's going to save the whole city? And also, is it fair that he dies if it saves the whole city? Even if it saves the whole city, like, what would his family think? So I wrestled with that. I, I Googled it. I couldn't find an answer. I'm sure it's top secret. Uh, my, my friend who knows probably wouldn't tell me, so I got stuck with trying to find the answer on my own, which I couldn't. And I couldn't get it out of my mind. And I thought to myself, what happens? What happens if this kid finds out he's going to be killed because it's the best thing for the world? Does he, does he allow it? Does he not allow it? And what does it do to his psyche? And so that's what the story in Mythborn 1 happens. It takes eight days, and it counts down each day towards where he's going to be executed. And the choices he makes, uh, some good, some bad, uh, and when I say good and bad, I mean in relation to what's good for him or bad for him. Other people, based on his choices, think of him as a good guy or a bad guy. And I think the reason why people love reading Mythborn and have gotten so much good um, feedback on it is they can identify with someone stuck in a situation where there are no good answers. And, and they're not a bad person. They're just trying to stay alive or just trying to do the thing they need to do. So... I think that what's really amazing with the character of Mythborn is that Eric is just like anyone else. And how much of how much can you take before you start doing things you would never thought you would do in order to uh, stay alive and, and and you know fight another day? So uh, I think what's great about the series is the he's he's an amazingly conflicted and and interesting character uh the princess yateji is uh one of his companions she's bright she's beautiful she's badass in every way and uh i hope they beat that uh <laughs> but uh he um you know she's she's amazing and 
And what's, what I thought was a huge amount of praise to me was someone on Facebook wrote, uh, how did I, how would I, I, I used to, I grew up on, you know, fantasy and science fiction, and uh, I read a little, and lo and behold, the dragons are, are a-holes, the, the uh, prince is a mamby-pamby, you know, uh, kid, and the princess is the, is the badass prince. And, and Eric is, you know, the, the kid stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I thought that, that was cool. That was cool. That's exactly what I wanted to achieve. I wanted to have characters who uh, wear black and white, that they were shades of gray. And I, I hope every single one of you give the book a chance, read through it. Uh, it is not what you think. It starts with stuff that you probably are, are familiar with, fantasy type stuff like dwarves and elves. But believe me, the world of Eden is not what you think. It, everything in that world has a reason for existing. Every sentence I write, there's a reason behind it. And when you give, if you give the book a chance, you'll see magic in this world, it actually could be real based on how this world has been put together. For more information, make sure that you guys uh, check out www.mythbornmedia.com. Um, and you know my my uh, my erstwhile team is putting up online where you guys can see it too. Uh, you can contact me through my website. You can contact me through my Facebook page. Um, you know I've I've mentioned the website, so now they can check off the green thing and not be uh, angry at me. Uh, but you know um, check out the books. Go to Amazon. Read the reviews. Uh, you know uh, I, those people bought the book. They read it and they said what they thought. And it's got over, you know, a 4.3 or better after 85 reviews. There are more reviews coming inbound. Books two and three are done. Book four is halfway done. And, you know, book five will be launching uh, all of this to be out, I hope, by the end of the year. Um, I really, really can't wait to get this, um, you know, into the video game format. I really can't wait to see it on television or as a movie. Uh, it's all going to happen. Believe me, my entire career here in Hollywood at National Geographic, as you know, in every single phase of life that I've done, has been working towards this moment, making Mythborn the greatest it can be. And I sincerely hope every single one of you join me for it. Thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great day. Peace out. And now we're ending. <laughs>